You're listening to CX Passport, the show about creating great customer experiences with a dash of travel talk. Each episode, we'll talk with our guest about great CX, travel, and just like the best journeys, explore new directions we never anticipated. I'm your host, Rick Denton. I believe the best meals are served outside and require a passport. Let's get going. With a name like CX Passport, this is most definitely a global podcast. That's why I'm so happy when I get to hear voices from around the globe tell their perspective on customer experience. Today is one of those days as I get to talk with Olga Budieri talking with us from Amman, Jordan. Olga is the global head of customer experience at Aramex, a Dubai-based international courier, transportation, and logistics services company. With a mission to ignite the passion for customer experience in the Arab region, Olga knows what it takes to create CX transformations at an enterprise level, spanning design, voice of the customer, journey mapping, and even getting to that heart, those cultural shifts to customer centricity. Sadly, I've only had the chance to change planes in Jordan, but today I will experience it vicariously in my talk with Olga. Olga, welcome to CX Passport. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Rick. I'm very excited to be here today. Hi, I'm I'm, uh, truly, this is so exciting for me. You're my first person to talk to on this uh, podcast from Jordan. I can't wait to get the Arab perspective on customer experience. It It is exciting for me. So let's just start with something that I saw on your LinkedIn profile. Your title starts with, architecting human experiences. Tell me why you chose that as your headline. Uh, I think a lot of the times we we focus, uh, we zoom in a lot on the customer experience and we forget that there are people who are delivering this experience. Uh, And in this new economy where we have uh, uh, Uber-based working models and so on and so forth. So we have, for example, Aramix Fleet or we have Aramix Spot. Uh, We have a lot of setups where we rely on the community to deliver parts of the services as well as our teams. So we try to uh, build a lot of the tools that are centered around the customer experience, but also around the human experience. So we make sure that whoever is operating this, uh, they don't have a lot of mental load. They are aware of the steps. It's very simple, user friendly and so on and so forth. So that's why the word human experiences was important to me. You know, that that really fits with me, actually, Olga, because and it fits that architecting and human part of it. I think there's something special in what you described to me there is you talk about the humans and getting it right for the humans. But you mentioned, uh, if I don't have the exact right words, but, you know, the process behind it and making sure that they're equipped to do that. How do you blend that, those sort of human and process worlds together so that you don't have just the coldness of process or the just... Uh, well, let's just call it the very loose nature of humans. How do you bring those two worlds together? It's definitely an iterative process. So it's not a one size fits all. It's not something that you do once. Uh, and typically, whenever we, we launch a solution, we work on developing a lot of our solutions in-house at Aramix. So whenever we launch, we would uh, try it out in one location, uh, figure out how it works, and then figure out how we can globalize it. So this will rely on feedback from our people, feedback from the community, feedback from the customers, uh, whether it works, and obviously voice of the business. So is it actually achieving the purpose or not? So this is how we try to scale up. Uh, And we try to figure it out in different locations. So sometimes we try it in UAE, sometimes we try it in KSA, sometimes we try things in Australia, South Africa, and then we scale up. So there is always that variability and learning from different places across the globe. I'd like to unpack that a little bit. And, and you've even talked about how you said we're guilty of starting with this just laser focus on our own neighborhoods. And I know that you know a lot of times, specifically those of us from the West have a very Western perspective. And that's why I love talking to folks that are outside of the West to get a non-Western perspective. You've said a very similar thing of starting that focus in the neighborhoods. It goes to what you're describing there, testing and, and exploring those global. How do you balance that local with this global perspective on customer experience? It is, it's definitely a day, day-to-day thing, I would say. So there is, there is a global strategy. There is an annual strategy that we put in place. There is constant communication with our local stakeholders. Um, and a lot of the times it's, uh, it's mutual or it, it comes from different places. So um, sometimes it's someone from South Africa saying, you know, look, guys, uh, this solution you have, the global one, is great. 
but I'm looking at something else. And that's where we will intervene, back up. We will say, how about we explore together? Do you want to build it together? Do you want to build it on your own? And mm-hmm. then we we iterate, align, and learn from you. So it's always a mutual process of who, you know, how we will take it. Um, we we tend to, to call ourselves uh, more of a democracy. So there is always a global perspective. There is a global knowledge base. But then each of our locations is independent and they can take or make their own decisions as far as how they want to build experiences. And obviously there is a mutual exchange and support between both teams. I like that flow back and forth. I've I've talked a little bit at, at time at other times talking about how 2020 is the year that not everything changed. And one of the things that's so important is that learning from your front line and then taking solutions from the front line. So uh, adapting that a little bit to what you just described there, if I would consider South Africa, say a quote front line, working directly with the customers of Aramac, um, being able to understand what their experience directly with the customer, bring that back into the global headquarters, if you will, and then co-design together. I think that's a valuable approach. It's something that, you know, not everybody really pays attention to that front line, and I'm glad to hear that y'all do. Um, I have one question for you. It's just almost a very quick question. You said voice of the business. Is that because Aram is very often a um, a B two B approach? Is that why you you do voice of the business? Actually, it's um, we have a lot to focus on corporate or B two B customers, but also we we have a huge focus on B two C or consumers as we call them. And because we're such a wide wide provider of services so we've got everything under the sun you know we've got b2b b2b to c b2c <laughs> uh, every single model that you can think of 3pl 4pl 5pl oh it's gosh. all there <laughs> and our own e-commerce products obviously but what i meant by voice of the business was more into is it achieving the objectives the efficiency objectives the goals of the business is it achieving the financial objectives is it scalable um, so sometimes when we uh, look at certain solutions in terms of customer communications or in terms of experiences, it might be a great solution. Uh, but when you look at, for example, uh, you know, if I tell you the volumes uh, that we receive as far as shipments, et cetera, then you imagine the scale. So how many people are going to be asking, where's my package? <laughs> That's going to be millions of people. So then when you look at the scale, it's great as a small solution, but it cannot be scaled up. So this is when we look at the voice of the business. Is it scalable? Is it more efficient? And so on and so forth. Gosh, such a brilliant approach of blending that outside in of customer with the inside out of process and operations. The We hear a lot of talk about you know understanding the ROI of customer experience. I love that idea of the voice of the business. So that from the very beginning, you are choosing to integrate these customer experience solutions, these customer experience ideas into the business objective. So they're not viewed as something separate, but rather advancing the business forward. And I like that. Let me, I know there's an area of your background in the contact center. I know you've done a ton of work in that area. So I'm kind of curious at your perspective, how do we make that both a more intelligent and a customer responsive type experience? That, that's, that's a question. I think that's a million dollar question that the whole world <laughs> is trying to crack, isn't it? It is. Sure um, is. So it is definitely connected to scalability and it's, it's definitely not something that you do overnight. Uh, What we've started with, with, um, and this was probably four or five years back, looking at what kind of requests are coming to the contact center and why, and what is the underlying process. So, for example, if someone's tracking their package, what are they trying to learn from Aramix? Why aren't they using our digital tools? Um, Can can we automate it? And we ended up building um, an ecosystem of uh, voice bots uh, with human handover whenever there is an issue. Um, so the system is intelligent enough. It will figure out if you have an issue with your package, it will automate automatically uh, connect you to a human agent versus if you just had a simple query, it will answer it and then offer to connect you in some instances or potentially offer to do certain actions because we, we deliver a lot of packages to receivers and we deliver a lot of e-commerce and a lot of banking products. So welcome kits, credit cards, pin codes, and some of these tend to be um, shipments where signature is required or the actual person receiving the package is required to be on premise. So we need to confirm whether you're there for delivery. 
So uh, if there is such an instance where we need to confirm delivery, the system is intelligent enough to figure that out and it will trigger this instance for you so that we ensure that the whole journey is streamlined. So when we look at contact center, we're not just looking at in terms of the calls, we're trying to figure out, are we streamlining the, the journey all across? Or are we solving, for example, an issue with the contact center and creating an issue with operations? Yeah. <laughs> so we're trying to create that balance there as well. A very thoughtful approach of making sure that when you busted out the silos, you're looking across all the areas. I like that preemptive strike of understanding you know, what the customer, predicting why the customer is contacting you in the first place. There was a, a podcast guest. I can't remember the episode. It's a few ago. Ito Cohen talked about that exact thing of if the inbound, if you already know that the package is delayed and if the customer is contacting you, there's a 99% chance they're calling you about that package. And so Pre presenting solutions up front rather than making the customer go through the entire description of what's happening. That approach, Olga, makes a ton of sense to me. And I, and I, I, I think we all welcome that. And that would be more customer responsive. Now I'm going to pivot on you here a little bit. I know that working for a logistics company, I imagine you've had some interesting travel experiences. Now, when we talked ahead of time, you'd mentioned a trip to Dubai, a place that I am so eager to see. I would just tell me about your experience in Dubai. So uh, which one? <laughs> so Tell me about time. any experience yeah. in Dubai. <laughs> now I'm really jealous. I've never been. And you get to say, which experience in Dubai? <laughs> Wonderful. So before the pandemic, actually, my role was requiring to spend um, a week in Dubai every month. So that's a lot oh. of back and forth, obviously. Um, and I think it's, 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 it's a lot of just experiences combined. Um, I've never seen, I think that's an interesting part. I've never seen Dubai as a tourist. Okay. I've been there probably 20, 30 times maybe, but I haven't actually experienced the city. So I get to experience it as um, someone working in Dubai maybe. Yeah. So it's um, arriving on Saturday afternoon, working in um, the logistics uh, center, which is about 40, 45 minutes away from the city center. Mm -hmm. Um from Sunday till Tuesday afternoon, and then flying back. So this is a very typical trip format for me. Um, I think it's it's a, it's a it's a very interesting city with a lot of interesting people. Um, maybe one of the most interesting. It's a very short flight, uh, but one of the most interesting pieces was when we um, had to travel within a day to Dubai, and all of the flights were booked. So we ended up taking the longest route to Dubai. Um, you, you don't take transit to Dubai. And uh, because everything else was booked, we, we, we got a transit flight through Bahrain. So that was very interesting. Okay. So yeah. It's like sort of a really long detour. That is a really long detour. That's a surprising little uh, path that you had to take there. The worst part was the detour back. Okay. Because you know it's coming. Oh, I've experienced that too. So I've done some travel in my past uh, with some companies that I've worked for. And it is interesting, the difference between being a, uh, a uh, they're on a business trip and then there as a tourist. I, I've had the chance to do kind of both in the same trip a couple of times. I, uh, Hong Kong is one that comes to mind. I would actually always try to, when I was doing Asian trips, I would try to make sure that I had my weekends in Hong Kong. And so that I could at least have a couple of days to be just a isolated tourist rather than part of the horde touring factories. And the like, did you ever, is there, is there one particular experience in Dubai that you remember maybe a meal, maybe a restaurant that or something that might be particularly special? Um, I think, I think definitely the first one was quite interesting. Um, so I'm, this is the part where I'm jealous because when you have two kids, you don't get to spend extra time. That's true. Obviously you want to get there and back as fast as possible. But the first time, and because uh, I was not used to the scale of uh, maybe the shopping centers, the locations oh, yeah. in Dubai, and sort of the, the traffic, because Jordan tends to be a smaller uh, city in terms of the setup and mm -hmm. in terms of the buildings. So I was in awe of all of the high-rise buildings, and then we went to Dubai Mall. And this is a place where you would probably spend the whole day, Gosh. and you're just walking at a very slow pace and exploring. But my manager at the time, he was, uh, we were late to a dinner. So he was taking me through all of those supposed attractions. So he's like, this is the, the fountain with the angels. And we're just <laughs> rushing past 
outlet. Speed this is round. the fountain, the big one with the music and the lights in front of Burj Khalifa. And, you know, and we're just rushing through it. So it was a very fast forward mishmash of stuff happening. Dinner was great, though. Olga, with that kind of rushing around, and it, it may be not between Jordan and Dubai, but hopefully you've had a chance to experience the lounge a bit. You need a little rest with all that. The two kids and, and my goodness. Let's So let's just take a little break here, a little change of pace. Join me in that first class lounge and we'll hopefully have a little fun here. What is a dream travel location from your past place you've been? So I would definitely want to go to Austria again. I was okay. there as a student. I would love to, to go to Austria, maybe on vacation, just experience the city in a different um, light as, a, as an adult, vis-a-vis -vis as a young adult. <laughs> so as someone who actually has a credit card and can yes. experience things. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, those that I know it's an audio podcast. I am laughing and rolling back in my chair because it brings some memories to me, Olga. I was the cliched backpacker after my university time. And so I did Europe in a backpack on a 50 US dollar a day budget uh, back in the 90s. And that included lodging and everything else. So I understand that desire to go back when you have money <laughs> as opposed to the student version of it. And I imagine that Austria and Jordan have quite different experiences and that would be fun to see. Thinking about going forward. So you've never been to this place before, but what is a dream travel location that you have not been to yet? I, I tend to fantasize about either going to uh, maybe India or maybe somewhere in South America, somewhere with a lot of yeah. jungles and a lot of exotic creatures and just trying to figure out sort of the, the National Geographic version of things. Yes. Be like a nature kind of experience, not necessarily the typical safari with the elephants, but more of, you know... Um, uh, where they show the cooking shows, the chefs who are cooking in front of a uh, rainforest. And I like that. I like the idea of combining the, uh, the rainforest and the, and the cooking aspect of it. So now you've given me a segue to my next question, which is what is a favorite thing to eat for you? That, that's a tricky one. Um, I think, uh, it, it, would it be a local or international cuisine? It's, it's whatever you want to say. So for international cuisine, I would go for sushi for yeah. local, probably, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, uh, but we have this uh, stuffed vine leaves. Okay. Stuffed grape, grape leaves that are stuffed usually with rice and meat. Yes. Uh, I, I know I, I ha I've had it at Greek restaurants and Mediterranean restaurants. So I know it for some reason the name is escaping me, but it's delicious. Well, what's on the other side, Olga? So growing up, what is a thing your parents made you eat? but you really didn't like as a kid. Um, I don't, I don't have memories of actually eating it, but I think that this is the, the horror of every child who has a, a Eastern European background. So there is this Russian dish called khaledyet. Okay. It's typically um, a jelly with pieces of meat or pork or chicken in it. And it's, it's very multifaceted because you could heat it and eat it as a soup as well, <laughs> but it's very plain. So it's definitely something I've been in terror of. Boy, I, I can imagine. Food. Yeah, that does not sound like something that kids would enjoy. I'm not sure I would enjoy it as an adult, but I'm always willing to try something. So if I'm there, I will, uh, I will, I will try it. I just may not enjoy it. So now thinking back to travel, what is one travel item, and you can't include your phone, that you will not leave home without? Definitely my hair stuff, my hair straightener, hair <laughs> curlers, stuff like that. Olga, I think your last answer to that question just uh, hits me at my heart as someone who has hair just disappearing as rapidly as possible. I, I would love to need to travel with a hair kit, <laughs> but sadly, my hair is starting to abandon me. You mentioned um, growing up in Moldova. And you're working for a Dubai company, you're living in Jordan, having grown up there in Moldova. And I grew up in Austin, Texas, USA, and I thought I was cool, but you totally have me beat. How has that global experience, all these regions, how has it shaped your approach to customer experience? Um, I think definitely a diversity and understanding their differences between cultures is something that we've, we've always been um, aware of mm -hmm. since I was a child. 
um, especially um, the contrast with Eastern European and Arab culture. Arab culture is very, it's very persistent. So for example, if you have a guest who's coming over um, and they, you offer them something to drink, they refuse the first time, you have to offer three times. Okay. Or you're, you're kind of fired out of the culture. <laughs> so you have to be persistent. Um, but um, Eastern European people tend to be more, okay, fine, that's settled then. So this was always the difference that I was uh, aware of. Um, also, um, the multilingual aspect of it. So I've uh, grown up always speaking multiple languages, so Arabic, uh, Russian, and then English from school and French from school as well. So this has a sort of... Um, enabled me to to read different things in different uh, cultures, experience different ways, how cultures exp express themselves in terms of languages and so on and so forth. Um, and it, it always piques my interest into how people express themselves. I think in some cultures, I was watching, um, I think it was a TED podcast where uh, someone was mentioning a culture did not um, use the words East or West. Uh, but they use the words um, north or straight or something to that effect. Yeah. So they were exploring how the difference in the wording impacts the way people think, um, their sensitivity to certain topics or their approach. So this has always intrigued me um, as experiencing different places of the world. Yeah, it's so important. I, I have I've only grown up in in the U.S. and so. My family, thankfully, I was born into a family that loved to travel and chose to expose ourselves to the globe through travel. And then I'm, I'm doing the same, hopefully, with my own children, trying to do the, the same and expose them to the cultures. It's so important, Olga, what you're describing there of the idea, the recognition that the way I know it is not the only way it is done. The saying East and West is normal to me, but perhaps for others, it's another way. The, and I love your example of the persistence because there's a little part of me, the U.S., especially in maybe Texas or the Southern U.S., has a little bit of that hospitality. No, no, take this drink, take that kind of stuff. But I also have a bit of a, all right, you don't want it? Fine, let's move on. And so maybe I've got a little Eastern European in me as well, but that understanding that just because the way I do it is not necessarily the way they do it and being able to be open to the, those differences, travel and exposure to different regions is so important. And so since we've established, right, we've, that customer experience is not the same around the world, you had mentioned to me earlier that this a digital adoption, which is so important to a lot of things that we've experienced, but you're seeing that digital adoption is not the same across the globe. It, it's country by country, region by region. You know, what are you seeing and, and what do you think is driving some of those differences? So de definitely um, the adoption of maybe tools as mainstream, this impacts um, the adoption of tools as customers. So let me give you an example of that or elaborate. So for example, we have a huge, um, I would say customer base or active user base on our WhatsApp chatbot. Um, okay. Probably over 13 million at the moment. Um, and uh, this this is uh, varying across the world. But then if you are in a country where WhatsApp is prevalent as a means of communication, so more, you are more likely to uh, accept um, a query or a workflow triggered by Aramix on the WhatsApp chatbot vis-a-vis -vis if you're in a country where maybe Facebook is more prevalent, right. then you, you would be more present there or if it's Snapchat or if it's uh, none of these social media tools. So for example, in uh, China, you would find WeChat and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, Australia used to be one of the countries where we had really, obviously WhatsApp was not one of the tools where you would be looking at. Uh, I think after the pandemic or during the pandemic, the Australian government was using uh, WhatsApp to notify citizens about certain updates related to COVID and so on. And that ramped up the digital adoption. So we ended up building a chatbot there as well that is dedicated for Australian customers. So this is one of the things that would definitely drive having uh, users actually present on the platform or on the digital location. Yeah. And it's very easy to actually engage them once they are there rather than acquire them on that uh, platform or yeah. location. And this is where we try to meet our customers. 
Um, and then probably the urgency of what you're ordering or the urgency of what you're expecting. Are you expecting a package? You're not expecting it. If I'm expecting a wedding dress, say, or a Christmas present, I will be very eager, eager to um, answer or send you my location or send you my preferred dates of delivery right. uh, versus if I'm expecting, for example, you know, an envelope from the court. Uh, <laughs> right. so it makes a lot of difference what you're expecting. Um, and uh, we tend to have different products across the different countries. So that can also be uh, something to look at. Um, I think definitely also some of the some of the countries and the way they look at languages. So a lot of the the customers in the Gulf, we we tend to give them two options, English and Arabic. But then as you expand, you might find uh, other languages or people who are, uh, for example, Turkey. They're very proud of their language. Mm-hmm. They don't typically engage in uh, English platforms or in conversations in English. So you have to be very adaptive to increase digital adoption there. Yeah. And that's how we try to build workflows in local languages as well. And that goes back to the question that we were talking about before, and that is the appreciation that the way we do it is not the same as the way they or, you know, the we's and the they's and different regions, how they may do it. And so being attuned to your customer's approach, I've talked to, you know, uh, companies before us that the China example, specifically, they were doing a voice, the customer program and had failed to consider that uh, in China, it's WeChat and email is almost always ignored. And so helping them involve their Chinese customers required that understanding of the culture and the way that that culture wanted to communicate. I want to close that. Let's, oh, so go ahead. Go. I was going to say this is the part where the ongoing collaboration with the local teams first is very important because these are things yeah. that we would not normally know from an HQ perspective, but then our teams on the ground are in tune and they're aware of the cultural sensitivity and so on and so forth. So, so important that front line don't design your customer experience in a boardroom in a conference room without understanding and getting not just understanding, but getting that input from the front line. Olga, I'm sad to say we're getting close to the end of time here. And so I wanted to close out with something that I mentioned back in the introduction. And you had mentioned that it was your mission to ignite the passion for customer experience in the Arab region. I love that. Just tell me more about the desire and how do you plan to go about that mission? One of the things that um, I was noticing uh, that we don't we don't have a lot of content around customer experience in Arabic, and we uh-huh. have this new generation of young professionals, or they or might be the resources are there, they can get to them in English, but they don't necessarily maybe connect the dots. So we were trying. Uh, it's not only myself; it's a group of other CX professionals as well to create original content in Arabic specific to the region, or maybe um, some of the trainings that are more specific, maybe some of the articles that talk about the challenges faced by CX professionals in the Arab world, or even in some parts, translating part of the content for people who might not be able to experience it in different languages, um, and just creating that hub of information where they can access it. So that's definitely something that you can't achieve overnight. Uh, I'm hoping that we're we're able to create more resources for our people uh, so that they can um, just get the basics of it and then start creating and adding more um, perspective and thoughts on that as well. I, I have seen so much energy around customer experience in that region. That's why I feel so lucky to have been introduced to you so that I can hear that perspective because I only know my perspective and getting more of that, the whole Arab region as to the approach to customer experience and how we can grow that. And, and, and I love how what you described there was not a case of, you know, how can we import more from the West or how can we get more thought leaders from Europe, but rather how do we create the environment that speaks to it in the Arabic language, in the Arabic culture, and allow thought leaders from within that culture to create their own version of what customer experience looks like in that region. Brilliant. I I absolutely love that, Olga. I did mention we're come kind of near the end of time, and that's that's really it. But I do want to close out by asking, you know, how can people, if they want to learn more about Aramex, if they want to, you know, learn more about you and your role, how can they get in touch with you? Uh, so uh, feel free to get in touch via my LinkedIn profile. I've got all of my info there, my email, my uh, phone number, etc. 
And uh, if you want to drop me a mail at, uh, at my Aramix mail, you can just drop me. It's olga at aramix.com. Well, I will make sure all of that gets into the show notes and so that folks can contact you there. You're, you're a great voice of customer experience for the region. You're a great voice of customer experience in general. Olga, I've enjoyed talking with you today. I've come away with learnings that even I didn't expect, and I'm, I'm super excited about it. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me about customer experience, about customer experience in the region, your stories from around the globe. I greatly appreciate it, Olga. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us this week on CX Passport. Make sure to visit our website, cxpassport.com, where you can hit subscribe so you'll never miss a show. While you're at it, you can check out the rest of the ex for cx website. If you're looking to get real about customer experience, ex for cx is available to help you increase revenue by starting to listen to your customers and create great experiences for every customer, every time. Thanks for listening to CX Passport and be sure to tune in for our next episode. Until next time, I'm Rick Denton, and I believe the best meals are served outside and require a passport.